Welcome to Changing Higher Ed, a podcast dedicated to helping higher education leaders improve their institutions with your host, Dr. Drum McNaughton, CEO of The Change Leader, a management consultancy that helps higher ed leaders transform their institutions through holistic approaches to accreditation, institutional governance, strategic planning and implementation, university academics and operations, change management, leadership and culture, and marketing, positioning, and branding. Now here's your host, Dr. Drum McNaughton. Dr. Lori Varlada is Hiram College's 22nd president and its first female president. That in itself is news, but the way Dr. Varlada has gone about the job has been in a word simply outstanding. She and her leadership team have made wonderful changes at Hiram, including celebrating many first and breaking many records in key areas. These changes have landed it at number four in Washington Monthly's 2019 College Guide among colleges and universities that award bachelor's degrees almost exclusively. But what has been one of the biggest wins of her career at Hiram was how she and the team were able to do a top-to-bottom reorganization of academic programs, which they call academic prioritization, which she had 100% buy-in from faculty. She's here with us today to share the process and insights she learned going through this process. Lori, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, my pleasure. I'm looking forward to this very much. Uh, Let's get started right off the bat. You just went through a major org redesign at Hiram, and i really like to know the details behind that. First off, set up the scenario for us. How was it that you ended up coming to the point where you needed to do an org redesign? Our org redesign, which we have labeled an academic prioritization process, followed very closely on the heels of a strategic planning process. We had started a very inclusive strategic planning process the year before, and our strategic planning process, as the name would suggest, created a strategic plan who had two overarching goals, one, to grow enrollment, and two, to increase the financial sustainability of the campus. And in order to to do that, the plan called for several action items. And one of the action items explicitly called out in the plan was an academic prioritization process. So it followed very nicely from a plan that preceded it. That's And that's, to me, the best way to do it, especially as you refer to it as a stakeholder-based plan. What what kind of interactions did you have with, with staff, with faculty to get this forward? Well, um, as we, again, the strategic plan was a year-long process. It included probably half of the entire campus. Um, we had 80 faculty, um, full-time faculty at the campus, about 100 staff, and at least 50% of the people participated in the strategic planning process. When it came time then to embark on the academic prioritization process, much like the plan that preceded it, we invited every faculty member to the table to participate in the academic prioritization. We invited the student government at appropriate junctures, which we'll talk about, I suspect, later on in the podcast. We invited the staff assembly. Of course, the board of trustees were intricately involved as governors of the campus and the and the administration. So it was a it was a all all to the table type of plan, and that served a campus like ours particularly well. I think it serves pretty much every campus well when you can get that kind of involvement. The challenge being is you're a I, I'd say a, a small to medium sized campus. We're small. I would say we're a small campus. We have only a thousand students in the traditional college, and then another two hundred or so in the adult program. So I would definitely label us as a small liberal arts college. And that's beautiful because you can get that buy-in throughout the entire process. We have a saying when we do organization transformation, similar to what you did, is people support what they help create. Right. Um, During the strategic planning process, and then again with the academic prioritization, one of our mantras was it was shaped by the hands of many such that all of us could see our fingerprints on the end product. And that, I think, was very helpful, as you alluded to, in terms of the buy-in, having people feel that they were part of the of the shaping of the process and the product that it helped to generate. 
and process is critically important in, ac in academic um, life, as you know. Um, the means are very much um, as important as the ends in many cases. So it was important to create an inclusive and transparent process along the way. Very much so. Uh, would you go through some of the steps that you, you started through once you got to the point in your strategic planning process or actually in the implementation where you said, now it's time to do the transformation? What were the steps that you went through? Sure. Um, we had just hired a new um, dean, so I want to give our chief academic officer um, credit. Judy Meiskins came to us from Nebraska Wesleyan, and she um, is an established academic leader, and she worked side by side with me to facilitate this process. So the dean um, talked to the faculty very early on to say, okay, it's time now to embark on the academic prioritization. As part of our study on prioritizing programs, let's all look at the types of metrics that's used in the Delaware study. So if your um, listeners are not familiar with that study and thinking that they have to go through a process like this, I would highly recommend their attention to the, to the Delaware study. It's a benchmarking study that helps um, administrators and faculty do an analysis of departmental costs, scholarly activity, instructional costs, et cetera. So the first thing the dean did was to identify the intellectual framework that would guide our process, make it available to them. She then um, set out with, with me to create a timeline. It was very important that people had an idea how long the process would last, and then we would work back from the time that we wanted to make the um, get the, the, the board to vote on it so that there were no surprises in timing. We didn't want anybody to say, wow, I didn't know that this was coming up next. Another part of the uh, early steps was to be very clear that while we had a data-driven process and we had very um, we had very specific benchmarks or milestones, we were not going to become um, completely beholden to the process. In other words, we wanted it to be iterative and we wanted to allow ourselves to make changes if they were called for as, as mid-air adjustments. So to say, here are the milestones we expect to accomplish, here's the time that we expect to hit them, but let's not be, again, completely beholden hold into a process. If we need to take a little more time or accelerate, let's give ourselves permission to do that. She then created an ad hoc committee of five faculty. She created this committee um, with the hand in glove consult, um, consultation and conversation with the faculty chair. This committee was called SAT. Everything in higher ed has an acronym. This one was the Strategic Academic Team. And they decided to do the very heavy lift of helping the dean look at the, the self-assessments that we would call for in short order, order and to help us actually rank then the programs in terms of priority. Those that we wanted to keep in place more or less in, in current form, those that we wanted to add or grow, and those that we wanted to reduce or cut. So to, five, to find five faculty that were willing and able to do that very um, difficult and emotional work was important. And that was one of the early steps that she also did. How did you figure out, how did, how did your, your academic chief academic officer determine who were the right faculty to be on this committee? Yeah, and it's it's a really important question. And when we get to hiccups, I'll talk a little bit about um, the formation of SAT. Again, it was a it was a committee appointed jointly by the academic dean and by the chair of the faculty senate. They worked over a course of three or four small meetings, just the two of them. Um, I came to the first two. And we decided that we wanted to find five people that represented different parts of the campus, i.e. different disciplines. We wanted to have some scientists and some humanities faculty. We wanted it to be gender diverse. We wanted it to be diverse in terms of uh, faculty methodology, in terms of research. We wanted some qualitative and some quantitative people on it. So we were very deliberate in creating um, a diverse membership. And that served us very well. We were later criticized, and I will, I'm very you know, honest to talk about the few bumps that we hit, and in a process like this, you're going to hit bumps. Um, later, we were criticized for not having had that committee elected by um, the faculty as a whole. But because it was very important for us to have this diversity, the chair of the faculty and the academic dean felt it best, and I agreed wholeheartedly that the, the committee be appointed by these predetermined cri criteria that we, I just went through. The other very important criteria was that the, the people who were um, invited to serve on the committee had to agree 
that they were willing and able to put the needs of the campus ahead of any departmental needs. And that's a really um, big ask to make um, in academic communities where we're still somewhat siloed by discipline. But we had to find five, we had to find five people that were willing and able to make that level of commitment as well. And those are critical, critical things. Uh, you're absolutely right. Faculty members generally tend to be siloed, especially within their own discipline. And to get five folks who are willing, plus your provost, who are willing to look at it overall perspective of what's best for the university is fabulous. I, I give all of them credit. Um, there would It would have been a much, much more tenuous, perhaps impossible job to do this alone, um, the prov- the dean of the college, as we call um, this person and myself. And I feel very lucky, um, very fortunate to have had five faculty colleagues that we worked um, literally weekly with and that were willing and able to do this work and when necessary to be the communicators and the messengers to their colleagues about why it was important that faculty weigh heavily into this process, even though it's not the kind of work that most faculty relish doing. You're absolutely right. Most faculty would much rather be doing research or teaching rather than going in and doing organizational work. But yet, I'm sure you had people there who were willing to roll up their sleeves. They wouldn't have been asked to and volunteered to do it. Right. We did. We had those five people. They were fantastic. Shortly after their agreement to serve on the SAT, the strategic academic team, they uh, we empowered them to work with the faculty of a whole uh, as a whole. And we had at that point, 83 faculty. We have um, slightly fewer now. But they jointly then created the criteria around which departments would be prioritized. And again, this was a very collective, inclusive process, which which served the process and served, you know, me, the dean and the SAT members well. So eventually they came up with five or six criteria that were, um, again, uh, endorsed by all of the faculty, a committee of the whole. The departments had to show their connection to the mission. Departments had to show the level of faculty work or faculty productivity as um, defined in large part by the Delaware study. The faculty had to show a demonstration for helping the institution bring its own institutional priorities to fruition. Um, a, a, the fac- the departments had to show a demonstrated track record in securing external resources, either gifts or grants or regional acclaim. And the, um, the other criteria was student interest and workforce demand. So these were the criteria that the SAT and the faculty as a whole agreed on before any prior priority began. So it was really important to have the cri- criteria um, you know, obviously identified first so that there weren't seen to be any you know, favorites given out. So before anybody was, you know, assessed or was asked to do an, um, any type of metrics or measurements, the criteria were jointly identified by the faculty and the SAT. And I think that's critical. If you set those metrics up ahead of time and people can't go from the backside and go foul, you were gunning for us. Right. I'm guessing that there was some significant market research that went into determining some of these priorities. Am I right? Um, there was um, research that went into it. We did use a book by Robert um, Dickinson, um, one of the, the the Bibles, so to speak, on academic prioritization. And his book talks about some of those, these criteria. I was very fortunate to have um, good relationships with several presidents um, who are members of the Council for Independent Colleges. And I, um, I plus the dean and SAT members spoke with colleagues at other campuses who went through processes like this to, to understand what criteria they used. And we talked to a couple of other of um, consultants that we um, had worked with in the past to, to have them, we, we called it a reality check. Once we honed our criteria down to the six or seven that I just rattled off, we did a, a reality, a barometer check with some consultants in the field. And it seemed to be the kinds of criteria that everybody said made sense, would allow us to get some level of objectivity in place. It would not allow um, a natural favor or disfavor towards any one um, department or part of the campus. So we homed in on those um, six that I just I just named. That makes perfect sense. So you're at the point, you've got your committee name, they've developed the metrics by which they're going to look at the various departments and programs. What's next? 
Then we um, send a template out that has all of the criteria and then each of the criteria have two or three prompts underneath each one. And we send them to every single faculty member and ask if they could join forces with their departmental colleagues to answer the prompts, to address the prompts in written form as indicated on the template and then post them on a faculty portal so that everybody could see what every other department said about itself. And that we gave faculty about a month to do that. So the criteria were again created, a template was formed, a template was distributed to all faculty members. They had about a month to respond to it, um, to put their, their responses in writing and then to post it on a faculty portal to keep themselves honest and engage with all members of the community so that biology could see what English said and English could say what, see what computer science said and computer science could see what, say, see what nursing said, et cetera. So part of, um, we learned part of what our, our goals were early in the process, that transparency meant transparency for all. It wasn't just that administrators are being transparent with faculty, but that faculty are being transparent with each other and with administrators. So it was a, what would we say, a multilateral, not, not, not a unilateral type of transparency. Everybody, you know, had skin in the game. Everyone was doing their best and everybody was making their work available for others to review. That sounds like a critical step uh, because I remember doing a study for one institution a number of years ago talking about pay equity. And that was one of the huge things that was an issue there. There were certain folks that were faculty members who were making 250 plus thousand. And then there was others that were making 40,000. And one of the things that came out was we need trans more transparency. And of course, those who were making so much money did not want that kind of transparency. So it was, it became a real challenge. Transparency doesn't have limits. You know, if you really um, abide by the value of transparency, then it means that, you know, folks at all levels of the institution need to be transparent. And in this case, you know, folks at all um, areas of work, you know, the staff wanted to see it when it was appropriate, student government wanted to see it. So transparency, you know, became, um, again, a, a value that we worked hard to embody throughout the process. There were times where we might have fallen short here and there, but by and large, I, I feel very proud of the level of transparency that this process, and frankly, all processes at Hiram have really um, been able to exude. Those are fabulous qualities to have. I wish all institutions were that way. So now that you've gathered the data, what next? So now the, the SAT has the very hard work of starting to review the data. Um, at the same time that this appointed ad hoc committee called SAT was um, at work, we of course charged the Shared Governance Committee, the APC, the Academic Program Committee, with the same task. So we had two faculty committees working on parallel track, downloading all of the information in the portal, um, looking at the responses against the criteria that have been collectively identified, and then doing the hard work of, of creating three very um, general piles, a pile that said, here are majors and minors and programs that we want to grow. Here are programs, majors and minors and programs. By programs, I mean centers of distinction. We have five or six of them that we want to maintain in current form. And here are programs and uh, majors and minors and programs of distinctions that we not, might need to reduce. And we put them in th um, APC and SAT, put them in those three general piles. And that became the very grueling work of the of that spring semester. So that would have been spring 2018, where they spent two or three months creating those three piles. At the same time, and a very important piece of this, we had a, a, a concurrent process fueled by another group of faculty called the Innovators. And I'm just eternally grateful that another group of faculty said, we understand that some of our programs will need to be reduced and cut, but in order to maintain morale and to keep ourselves forward focused, we would, much like your permission, President Berlotta and Dean Meiskens, to create another group that's created, that's not only looking at existing programs to grow, but what kinds of priorities might we want to bring to life, you know, out of, out of the dust, so to speak. And that was the group of innovators. So it was really important to have our foot on the brake and on the accelerator at the same time. So that process was being undertaken by a third group yet. That's interesting because this is the first time I've heard of something like this. Normally, you have the same groups doing all these tasks, bringing in this separate 
group of faculty sounds like another way to get stronger buy-in in the whole process. It harkens back to the comment I made earlier in the podcast where we gave ourselves permission to make mid-air adjustments. And frankly, I didn't see this one coming. I didn't, it was not a Lori Berlotta idea. It was not a Dean Meiskin idea. This was a small group of faculty who said once they got into the work of the prioritization, it was emotionally draining. And we had two senior faculty members, Brad Goodner and Roxanne Sorek, who had been at the campus for probably 15, 20 years each. Um, who said we would very much like to, you know, create a committee that helps us identify things that we would like to bring into existence. We understand that we might not have the resources to do it immediately, but that will keep us focused and positive and keep our energies going. Do we have your permission to create this group and to forward our own set of recommendations? And we said, absolutely. And that was to their credit. They came up with that idea on their own and they worked unbelievably hard for the next three or four months to come up with some programs for innovate for innovative ideas. And did some of those programs for the innovations, did they come out of existing programs and new directions? Were they all new programs? What what did that look like? One of the biggest ones to come out of the innovation group was an overhaul of first year experience. So in that sense, we had a first year experience. We'd had it for many years, for a couple of decades. And the innovative innovator group wanted to change the first year experience, and they brought that recommendation forward. And today, I'm very proud to say that we've changed the first year experience to align very closely with the ideas of the innovator groups. This group also um, had the brilliant idea, and again, this was a faculty idea. This was not an administrator idea, administrative idea. They wanted to reorganize all of the departments into five, four or five schools. And that came out of the innovator group. And this was the group that within three months helped us create a brand new process where all majors at Hiram College are now one of five interdisciplinary schools. And that's a really great structure for us because our, our majors are so small. I mean, it's very possible to be in a major where there's only three or four senior students in the major with you. And it's much more, um, there's much more collegiality, much more affinity built. If you could be in a major, now we have a major for arts, humanity, and culture, for example. So some of our humanity majors are still very small, but it's nice that the English majors are in a school with the theater majors and the music majors and the history and the political scientists, um, et cetera. So students and faculty are joined through a school structure rather than just a major structure. And that idea came out of the faculty innovator group, and we were able to put it in place in three months. That's that's amazing to do something that quickly. Uh, yeah, it was and it, it was quick because it it, it grew out of a, a faculty um, a faculty organic process. People support what they help create. That is right. And so you've got all the recommendations. The group has gone through. How did you do put, do the hard decisions? How did you make those? How did you actually implement them? So the SAT worked, as I said, for two, probably two or three months then, that spring, um, putting them in the three pi piles. They agonized over, um, you know, what programs would eventually be cut. Those were the hardest decisions. What programs would be cut? And by cut, I mean certain majors were, were morphed into minors. And one program, religious studies, was cut altogether. We had only um, habitually had a single student majoring each year in religious studies. And the group um, agreed that we just couldn't um, have a full-time faculty member and a department in a, in a major that was only able to attract a single student each year. So they put them in these three groups, the let's keep them more or less the same, let's grow them, i.e. add a faculty member or add resources, and then let's reduce, either make um, morph them from majors to minors or in the religious studies um, case, cut them all together. And um, they went back and forth. They had the financial, um, they looked at a lot of financial data. They brought the CFO in to say, help us make sure that we're understanding this data correctly. What does it really cost to produce a degree in these areas? What are the faculty salaries? Let's make sure that we have it right in terms of any resources the departments generate. So they fact-checked their own financial metrics against the CFO's metrics. They did some one-on-one -on -one interviews, um, ex um, external interviews with members outside of the committee. Um, and then eventually they forwarded to me a list that said, President Verlotta, here's a list of 
six majors that we believe should be minors. Here's the one single uh, major that we believe should be eliminated. And then here are some majors that we believe should be augmented. Um, when the time is right, we believe that we should either add more adjuncts or add more full-time faculty to these, um, to these areas. And that work came to me in May of that year. Um, at the same time, the APC, the shared governance entity also brought a list and I was just uh, unbelievably um, relieved to see that the lists paralleled each other almost verbatim. So what APC did, I know what APC did um, in a parallel process that was not connected to SAT looked almost exactly what SAT brought to me. And that really confirmed that the work had been thorough and it was logical and rational to have two different faculty groups ultimately land on a very similar set of recommendation. I would say gave me peace, but that's overstated. There's not. This is not a peaceful process. This is a hard process. But I, I felt, um, again, I felt affirmed that we had done it the right way to have two committees come up with the same set of recommendations. I'm. I've never heard of anything like that, and, and really, it's a a testament one to your people. And two, to the transparency that, that you and your dean required in this whole process. I mean, that's that's fabulous. Thanks. I mean, it, it didn't feel fabulous when we were going through it. It was very difficult. But in retrospect, you know, again, I, I, I'm eternally grateful that we had a, a group of faculty willing to do the work. And as we, as I often say, the proof is in the pudding. But to have these two faculty groups land at similar recommendations was again, affirming. And then those recommendations were forwarded back to the faculty as a whole. They got to see them all again. They got to weigh in. They got to make commentary. Um, and the commentary of the faculty as a whole was part of the package that I brought to the board of trustees. And I, so that's exactly what, what that's what the next steps included. Faculty um, made comments. The dean captured all of the comments. I then brought the two sets of recommendation that virtually mirrored each other to the trustees along with there were comments from the faculty this you know including you know this makes sense but this is very sad this is upsetting that we have to cut religious studies we had five majors that became minors that were very you know it was emotionally difficult and i brought all of those comments to the trustees along with the recommendations and i supported the recommendations in in entirety the ones that came to me from both of those groups i accepted i did not make any changes i thought that they had done hard work and the board um, agreed unanimously with each and every. We voted on all of them separately. And I had 100% um, affirmation from a board of 38 trustees, I will say. It's not a small board. So wow. to have that level of um, agreement from two faculty committees and from 38 trustees, again, as difficult as this process was, I, I don't know of another process elsewhere that was able to you know, tell this, where this kind of story was able to be told at the end. And so you had the roadmap to move forward, and then it's just a matter of the implementation? Yes. So we had the roadmap to uh, move forward. The trustees made that decision, um, voted um, at their May meeting, their spring meeting. They affirmed um, in their entirety every one of the de decisions. And then we used the summer to start um, making those decisions. There were six faculty that were eliminated, um, sitting faculty that were eliminated in this process, whose positions were eliminated. That was very sad. Even though Hiram is not a wealthy campus, I um, was able to raise enough money um, myself and the vice president of development. This was an all hands on deck process where we were able to give every single faculty member at least a full year buyout and a full year benefit. So no one was out in the cold. A few faculty who had been here with us even longer got a little more than that. But I felt, you know, again, as difficult as this was to be able to treat people with that level of humanity was really important. So everybody had a full year benefits, a full year salary, and a few that a couple of the tenured faculty got a little more than that so that people could find themselves a new job and, you know, make some very difficult decisions um, in many cases at midlife and where they needed that time to regroup and to, you know, get on with, with the next part of their career journey. And I'm glad we were able to make that financial commitment to them. And that is a real testament to you and your board and everybody who was involved in the process. It's the, the survivors look to see how the folks who were let go or treated and you guys did it right by them. We did. We did it right by them. So we talked a little bit about hiccups and challenges. We've, we've covered some of those. Uh, anything that, that comes to mind that, 
you'd say for your your fellow presidents, this is this is a speed bump that you need to pay close attention to? Yeah, again, make sure that whatever committees are helping you with the process, that there is uh, a rationale for creating the committee. I would do it the same way we did it um, at Hiram if, if, if I had to do it over again. So although I was criticized early in the process for not having the SAT elected, I think it served us well. And I think that we could stand by the rationale we used for appointing the committee particularly since the faculty chair weighed heavily into that. That might not be a decision that other presidents make, but have a rationale for how the committee is formed um, is, is, is one thing that I learned through this process and would um, recommend in terms of hiccups to avoid. The other um, thing that I learned is to this notion of transparency, and you heard me talk about it throughout the podcast, is critically important. You must translate that rhetoric to reality. In addition to the transparent processes that were created through the tr- structure, I held 100 meetings myself during that spring semester, 100 different meetings with stakeholders, with faculty, with students, with alumni, with donors, with friends of the campus. And each of my vice presidents held 80 80 additional meetings collectively. So we had 180 meetings from the administrative team that were convened during that spring semester. So there's no rational person that could say, I wasn't involved, they swept it under the door, this was a painful process that we pretended wasn't happening. I mean, every day, there were days where I had four or five meetings, traveled to different parts of the um, country to talk to alums about it. And that was a really important, um, you know, it wasn't a hiccup at Hiram because we anticipated it. But those were a couple of things that were really important to anticipate early on in the process. That's great. So if you got some advice for your fellow presidents, besides what you've talked about, which has been fabulous, what are the three biggest takeaways you'd, you'd say for them? Again, um, if you're going to do an academic prioritization process, it can't just be about cuts and reduction. It must be about growth and augmentation too. So our phrase was that you need to have your foot on the brake and the accelerator at the same time. Most places can't cut themselves out of a financially precarious position. They must grow and reduce at the same time. So that's, for me, lesson number one. Lesson number two, again, is as we translate this um, notion of being data-driven from rhetoric to reality, There is an extraordinary amount of training that needs to take place in order for faculty in particular to become data driven. Our faculty are highly talented colleagues. They know their disciplines exceptionally well, but they are not as familiar with the kind of data that administrators look at on a daily or weekly basis. So simply providing faculty with metrics and data and financial benchmarks isn't enough. They have to be trained how to use that data, how to use that data to make very um, you know, evidence-based decision, just putting it in front of them and saying, okay, folks, here it is, go at it, isn't fair and isn't comprehensive enough. So data-driven means being data-trained. And sometimes we take for granted, our faculty are so smart, they have PhDs that they don't need that training. So that was another, you know, a a very important takeaway. The other, uh, I guess, third takeaway would be is to create a timeline and to make sure that people know what's coming next. The process, as I said, can be painful at times, and as few surprises as possible are an important goal to embrace. So making sure that people know, okay, here's where we are now, here are the next milestones or the next, you know, goals that we need to hit so that people can anticipate, you know, when will the process be done? When can we breathe a sigh of relief? What do we have either to look forward to or to be prepared for? But have a timeline. If you need to make adjustments, so be it. But make that timeline along with everything else public so that people understand what's next in the process. Thank you. Those are great takeaways for your your fellow presidents. So what's next for you? What's next for Hiram? Uh, Change is the new normal at Hiram. Um, Small colleges like Hiram, particularly those of us located in the beautiful rural parts of this country, Um, We'll have to continue to change in order to to not only um, survive, but to thrive in the next several decades of the 21st century. So change is our new normal. We are in the midst of rolling out a brand new tuition plan called Learn More, Earn More, Spend Less. It's not just a tuition discount model. We have reduced our tuition by 35 percent, but we're one of the first schools in the country to offer free summer classes so that students can accelerate their studies and get out a full year in advance or um, uh, de-accelerate their studies. So if a student, for example, 
is on a traveling team and has a lot of competitions in the fall and is thinking, wow, I would really like to drop this class, but I can't because I don't want to fall behind. He or she could take it in the summer um, and stay on track. Um, conversely, if, if a student wants to get out in three years, can take two free summer classes. So that's the learn more part of it. The earn more part of it is we've added 100 paid internships for the summer. So students are not only earning more um, money through paid internships, they're earning more career experience. And of course, they're spending less because they are spending no money on their summer classes. And they're likely spending less because a lot of them are able, will be able to cut their time at Hiram by a semester or a year. And they're spending less in terms of our reduction of the 35% um, reduction in sticker price. So that will go into effect for fall 2020. It's been heralded by members of um, the academic community as being a new model for private colleges. And we're very much looking forward to see the fruits of our collective labor in that one as well. I think that's those are great, great things coming up on the horizon. Maybe uh, in six months to a year, let's check back and uh, see how things are going. Very good. Thanks for having me on your show this morning. Lori, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks for listening today. And a special thank you to today's special guest, Dr. Lori Varlotta, president of Hiram College. Lori, thanks for being on the show. It was a pleasure having you here and listening to how you've gone through the academic prioritization process at Hiram. Our next guest is Dr. Philip Rouse, provost and senior vice president for academic affairs for the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Dr. Rouse has been at UMBC since 1990 and since being appointed provost in 2012 has been instrumental in revamping UMBC's shared governance model and will share with us what UMBC does and how they got to where they are. Thanks for listening and look forward to hearing from you about any ideas you may have for the show coming up. Changing Higher Ed is a production of The Change Leader, an organization committed to transforming higher ed institutions. Find more information about this topic, along with show notes on this episode, at changinghighered.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to the show, and we would also value your honest rating and review. Email any questions, comments, or recommendations for topics or guests to podcast at changinghighered.com. Changing Higher Ed is produced and hosted by Dr. Drum McNaughton. Post-production by David L. White.